Hi, I'm Claire Corbett, and this is the Sirens of Audio. I need a stand for my... That's why I don't have notes. I hate... Are you ready? What are you looking at? <laughs> I'm trying to organise myself. Okay, here we go. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. And I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. Good day, Dwayne. Got to start a sentence with and. You never should start a sentence with and, should you? Oh, if you're talking, it's different. Okay. You should never write a sentence with and. Well, generally speaking, occasionally there might be good good reason to do it, but you should have a deliberate reason for doing it. H- how hello, are doing? audiophiles. Why are we doing all this? What are you talking about with your grammar? Oh, I don't know. So we're going to be talking a lot about books today. So books are on my brain and writing and stuff like that. So, oh, okay. uh, in particular, audio books. Because today on the show, we're going to be talking with Michael Stevens, who's the commissioning editor editor for BBC Audio. So he's in charge of looking after the target novelisation range and lots and lots of other things. And he's been in the, a similar role for many, many years. So it's going to be fascinating to have a chat with him to see the process behind commissioning these audios and the decisions that get made along the way because there are uh, some some choices that are made that uh, I sometimes think, I wonder what, how they came to that choice, particularly when it comes to readers and things like that. I mean, why is Stephen Pacey reading um, Terminus, for instance? Yeah. So that's, that, that's a specific question I want to put to him. So with that in mind, Philip, yes, do I. there is one thing we need to do first. You know what that is? Yeah, I do. Yeah, we're going to jump down the rabbit hole. Here we go. <laughs> Did you notice, Philip? Yeah, we went up the rabbit hole this time, which is good. It's been a long time since we got up the rabbit hole. So. Yeah, I'm mixing it up again. <laughs> All right, so in this rabbit hole topic, I want to talk about the the target novelizations is, uh, is what going to be a big part of our conversation today and Doctor Who in different media. Um, I was looking through the lists of audiobooks today, and there are masses and masses of books that I have never heard, and I don't think I've got enough life left in me to ever hear them. Have you know? Have you ever seen looked at a list of what's out there? I have most of them. Yeah, you've been you've been very pedantic in collecting pretty much everything. Have I you? I'm dreadful. I just. How I'm still married is beyond me. So yes, I, I <laughs> So my yes. question is, have you listened to everything at least once? No. No, I'm, I'm masses behind. I mean, the trouble with the audio books is they just take so long to get to. Yeah. And, um, and I've got them all downloaded now onto my iTunes, and I can't speed up iTunes. So it <laughs> makes life a bit harder. Can't you? No, unless if someone knows how to speed them up, but no, I don't think you can speed up iTunes. Okay. So maybe maybe I should look some more because if I could, it'd be great. Um, I tried to start listening to them all, and I started buying them all on CD as they came out on CD. So all my original Target novels, because I, I have the entire Target collection. So every paperback I have with and every cover of every paperback I own, which is stupid, and. I'm now three quarters of the way through my hardback collection because once I collected every Target cover, I decided, well, there's a couple of cheap hardbacks. So I thought, oh, they're pretty cheap. I'll buy them. And then they're not so cheap anymore with the ones I'm getting. And so when the CDs started coming out, I started getting the CDs as well to add to the collection. Then now I don't buy the CDs. I just download, from, usually from Audible. Audible, I get most of my... Target novels from Audible, which I think I can speed up Audible actually. Maybe just listen to them up there. But I do tend to transfer them onto my iTunes because I always have that in the car with me, ready to go. Yeah, there there is an, uh, a media player that I use called uh, VLC Media Player, and 
that will play the MP3s and uh, that speeds it up. Right. So, so I, I mean, I love the Target novels. I've just listened to the Romans and laughed all through it. Um, it was, I mean, that's always been one of my favourite novels anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think they're great. I love what they do with them, but it's just finding time. And just since starting this podcast, not only do I have to get through every month's big finish content. The new stuff. The new stuff, then you throw in extra things. And because we have guests on, I listen to things. So with all the audio listening I have to do to stay on top of this podcast, Targets has fallen to the side, unfortunately. And that's where I say that, I, well, we're talking Big Finish now, but on the Big Finish app, I say there should be a, a speed changer. I noticed on the Big Finish podcast this weekend that someone commented on, the, on that, <laughs> that yep. they remember... Nick and Benji ripping into me about uh, changing the speed. However, for, perp- for for things like what we do, it's, I think it's important. You can, if, if you're listening to an audio book that goes for nine hours and you listen to it at 1.5, there's an extra three hours you've got. Exactly. So, um, it's, I, I think it's better to listen to it far, a bit fast than not at all. Exactly. I agree. Uh, for, for review purposes anyway, if I was just listening to it for pleasure, then uh, I probably wouldn't speed it but because i want to listen to this and then i want to get on to the next thing the next thing uh, i think it it comes in handy it's a handy little tool for being able to speed through so what have been your favorites you've listened to in the target range oh my absolute favorite right now is the romans yeah absolutely it's a short book too isn't it, it only runs for about not even two and two, a half hours i was gonna say two and a half hours yeah it's pretty short so that was you know not much longer than a big finish audio story they're probably about the same length actually when you include the extras and uh, and music suites on the end. So, um, but and they had seven different readers in that book. So I thought that was a, a really nice way to enjoy that story, which is one of my favourites from the black and white era, anyway. And it, it's it's the same story, but totally different. And it's a a, to- a a really nice way to enjoy that story. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great book. I'm trying to get rid of the. The Myth Makers does the same thing. I think the Myth Makers might all be... No, I forget. How the, the Myth Makers is done in a unique way as well. I mean, they've been adding voices in terms of Dalek and Cybermen for a few years now, and that was a, a nice change to add that in. So it's, it's good yeah. that they, they continue to work at how to be creative. And obviously they've got the audience to make it worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. So. Well, we keep we keep re, rebuying this media whenever they repackage it. <laughs> Yes, well, that's in why whatever miss, form I've, been I've missing, done the I've been soundtracks the with narration. I'm resisting and, the Blu-rays. <laughs> yeah, you, you, that's where you finally put your foot down. Eh? Well, I'm feeling bad about it though. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> oh, I just I keep looking at all this content that's coming out and going. Oh, but anyhow, I'm still resisting. By the time I change my mind, it'll be too late. I can't buy them all. Yeah. Well, see, I never got all the VHSs when they came out. I got uh, quite a few of them. But not, I didn't get the whole collection, so I only really started seriously collecting from DVD on. And yeah, with the with the new features that you've got on the Blu-ray, I think it's uh, really good. So I don't I don't feel quite as ripped off as you, I don't think, when it comes to the amount of outlay you've spent because the VHSs were expensive, weren't they? Oh, I know, and I think I sold off. I actually sold them all off for about two hundred fifty dollars. I think I just sort of, is that right? Yeah, just sort of gave them all away as a drop drop lot. And they're big too, so they take up a lot of space as well. So, yeah, it's 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 an amazing show, isn't it, Doctor Who? That they can keep repackaging these things over and over again. Even even Doctor Who and the Daleks has just recently got a, a, a reprint as a graphic, or kind of a graphic novel, illustrated or an illustrated novel. novel. I've bought it. I just haven't got it yet. Yeah, waiting for it to come. <laughs> Who published that? Was that BBC that did that, or someone else? I don't know. I just saw it and bought it because that's what I do. See, that's an interesting audiobook as well because that is uh, and it's interesting to digest that story uh, through the book version uh, and therefore you know hence the audiobook as well because it's uh, it's got a completely different beginning to oh, yeah. the adventures yeah. of the doctor it's, it's quite Co. different actually and all in first person and William Russell does an amazing reading one of the first that's one of the first ones I bought was yes. William Russell yep doing, doing the Daleks yeah yeah, yeah. It's, a great, it's a great beginning, but it doesn't really change the characters a lot than what they were in Unearthly Child. Yeah. So, yeah, the the Target audio novelizations is, is a collection that I, you know, sadly haven't collected all of them. Got a lot of them, but I'm really appreciating them more since we're 
I've been forcing myself to listen to them so I can talk about them on the podcast. It's it's great. Yep. They're Indeed. really, really good things. And the the other things that BBC Audio are doing with things like um, Beyond the Doctor, they're really interesting stories too. So there's just so much in Doctor Who. Is there any other uh, show that is so inventive, do you think, out there? No. It's pretty I'm limitless. Biased. It's limitless in its scope. It is. So there's just so many things you can do with it. It's probably the most um, diverse ranging franchise that there is. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with with, uh, Bad Wolf Studios and what they do with that, see how much more content we get out there. Yeah, I mean, it it, it and Star Wars are probably the two things that are out there that does, does the most in terms of different mediums, wide and wider universes. Um. Yeah, and, the, and the but even Star Wars cool. seems a little bit more constrained than than Doctor Who does. It's so, it's more in a time period. Yeah, of you know, hundred years, which doesn't change much. Definitely. Yeah. Very good. Just a little chat about those things. Just thought that'd be interesting to talk about since we're talking about uh, the the Target books in particular, and we will jump out of the rabbit hole. Actually, I'll throw in a little bit of the Romans and give you a taste of of what that sounds like, and we'll come back with Michael Stevens in a moment. Chapter 18. A Poisoner Remembers. Extract from the Autobiography of Locusta. It was another busy day in the pharmaceutical department, and I remember reflecting that if business continued to improve at that rate, it would kill itself off before it got fairly started. And where would I be then, I asked myself having only one pair of hands at that stage in my career, and that couple time-worn and gnarled with arthritis or some such affliction, which in the present state of medical knowledge we do not truly understand. Although I work constantly at a wonder drug in my spare time, if any, keeping a sharp lookout for unwanted side effects, because who knows when they might not come in useful. No, what I really needed, it seemed to me, if I was to give of my worst whenever requested, was an assistant to take the weight off my crucibles now and then, so as to let me get on with a spot of high-level government research into astrology like the rest of my coven, who were doing very well for themselves, thank you, with horoscopes of the famous, while I slaved away for peanuts in my rotten grotto. No sooner had this long but half-formulated thought been caught in my attention than there came a knock on the laboratory door, causing me to drop a hot goblet on my frock and emit an eldritch scream. And there stood a pert young party who asked me if I could direct her to the imperial apartments as she seemed to have got lost. A likely tale, I thought, and was about to invite her to a final wine-tasting when it occurred to me that here might be just the apprentice my enterprises required. And I asked her if she'd ever considered a career in toxicology, as it was a growth industry right now. She said she'd try anything once, and introduced herself as Vicky, of no fixed address, which could be convenient, I thought, if the arrangement didn't work out. So I agreed to give her an hour or so's probationary period during which she could make herself generally useful, taking the drudgery out of my work by handling the victim-to-crypt delivery side of the business. And since she was on her way to the throne room any old how, perhaps as a favour to the Empress, she wouldn't mind taking up a couple of sparkling drinks. This one for Nero, and that one for his new lady friend, who was almost certain to be with him round about now. And if not then give it to whoever was, as it seemed a pity to waste it. I then turned my back for a moment and was gratified to see in the mirror that she immediately switched the glasses, which I had depended upon, having misinformed her as to which was which. So here I had a thoroughly dishonest and unscrupulous child who was almost certain to give every satisfaction and sudden death quite impartially It seemed I had chosen well. Michael Stevens is the commissioning editor for BBC Audio's Doctor Who range, and he's been involved with other brands such as 
The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Agatha Christie, Alan Bennett, and Terry Pratchett. He's also produced several stories for the Big Finish Short Trips range. It's our great pleasure to welcome Michael to the Sirens of Audio. G'day. G'day. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you both. Thanks for joining us. Now, many who work in Doctor Who these days were huge fans as kids. Was that uh, the case with you? Yes, definitely. I became a fan probably at the age of three, um, three or four. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's very strange, isn't it? We've, we've all got this experience. It hooks you in and it doesn't really leave you. And uh, yes, I, 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 all the way th through growing up um, into my teens and beyond, yeah, Doctor Who has been there uh, as a constant. What's your earliest memory? We love, we always love to talk about our earliest memories, don't we? <laughs> I have a very um, interesting early memory in that I, for many years, have, have believed it, it's a scene from Day of the Daleks. And specifically, it's the scene where the Daleks have the Doctor prisoner and he's on lying on the table. And in the background, um, you see the title sequence and the, the faces of the previous two Doctors. And I... I'm sure that that is my earliest memory, and yet the dates don't the dates don't quite work in that I would have been less than two on original transmission, and um, I'm not, I can't remember what the repeat transmission was for Day of the Daleks, if indeed there was one. So it's a little bit of a mystery, unless it was a clip I would you know that I was seeing in some other. TV show, don't know. But after that, I have fleeting memories of some of the Pertwee stories, but it was really with Tom Baker that I became to, I, you know, started to sit up and take notice and remember things. So then all the way through, um, because, I, yeah, as I say, I, I was, uh, when Tom Baker started, I, I'd been three or four. So it was from then on that, uh, I, you know, I, I would never not see it or if we couldn't see it for some reason you know had to go somewhere we'd either have to rush back to to get to see Doctor Who or I'd miss it and you know be pretty upset uh, and then I quickly got into recording the audio from the TV uh, you know which was a little foreshadowing of what I'd la later do for BBC Audio so, so what led you into a, a career in audio publishing? Was it, um, uh, I think, you, you, did you start out with the BBC writing copy and liner notes? Is that how you started? Yeah, I there? did, was... yes. It was a complete lucky chance. I, I was working as a, a website editor, actually, for um, a publisher, or, or rather a bookseller. And I used to get the magazine called The Bookseller, which is a sort of trade publication. And... Uh, at that time, you had jobs advertised in there, and a job was advertised for a copywriter for what was then called BBC Radio Collection. And I immediately knew that this was the sort of thing I, I wanted to do. In fact, I think I'd already decided by then, I, my one of my dream jobs would be to work for Radio Times. And this was pretty close because it, actually it was in the same building. and. It was, at that point, BBC Radio Collection was the publisher of BBC radio programmes and indeed some TV soundtracks. But, you know, the names mentioned in the advert, Alan Bennett, um, Agatha Christie, uh, Sherlock Holmes. I, I was, a, I, you know, I, I listened all the time to BBC Radio. And um, so I applied for that and um, after a several interviews and tests and things uh, because it was a copywriting job. Uh, I, I got that job, so I moved to London for, for that and um, joined a small team. It, it was a small team back then, and we were publishing on cassettes and CDs, a wide range of BBC programming. Can I ask, what does a copywriter do? 
Well, in this uh, instance, uh, with this specific job, it was writing the sleeves for all of the releases. So the sales copy on the back and then the uh, cast and credits. And um, sometimes we would commission a sleeve note or we would write our own sleeve note. So if it was an Agatha Christie drama, we would write a biography of Agatha Christie or anything that was pertinent to the, the title. Also, uh, if we wrote adverts, um, anything associated, you know, we used to do a catalogue. So I would write the introduction to the catalogue and all that sort of thing. So in, in advertising, a copywriter is, you know, specifically writing adverts, aren't they? But in publishing, and as I say, in this specific instance, it was writing any of the copy, any of the words for um, for the range. And that was a really interesting job. And on my first day, I was presented with proofs um, for uh, Doctor Who. I think it was Slipback and The Myth Makers. Those were the two forthcoming audio releases. The audio, the Doctor Who audio range was... Uh, in its early, very early days then. And the proof, you know, it was pre-digital pre or rather it was pre-online proofing and things like that. So we would physically get these big proofs come. You'd, you'd have to mark them up and send them back to the printer. Interesting. So from the BBC, you went to Audio Go. That seemed like, uh, was that about the mid 2000s that that happened? Yeah, but it, it, rather than um, it being a, a company that I went to, Audio Go was formed from what was then called BBC Audiobooks. Because, uh, yeah, I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. BBC Radio Collection was part of BBC Worldwide when I first joined. We then bought um, a small audiobook company called Cover to Cover that happened to publish the Harry Potter audiobooks. And suddenly the Harry, Harry Potter took off and we had a, this huge business. This then led BBC Worldwide to buy another audiobook company called Chivers and they were based in Bath. And all these companies formed a larger company called BBC Audiobooks. That's what we, that's the business that we began in Bath. After several years, that business was 90% uh, share was sold to a group of private investors and the, the, the name Audio Go was formed. So it moved away from being a BBC owned company, but it still had the BBC publishing license and it became Audio Go. So, you know, we all continued, the, the business continued ostensibly as it was. It just had a change of name. And then Audio Go ran until 2013. So Audio Go did something quite special in Doctor Who, something that Big Finish had already tried to do and not succeeded, and that was to get Tom Baker to come and do full cast audio. So were you around at the time involved in that, getting Tom to come and do those stories? I certainly was. Yeah, I certainly was. What had happened was in 2005, we'd started the, the Target audiobook range, um, which was my idea and I set it up and we began and one of the early readers who we got for the range was Tom Baker because um, it just seemed like the obvious thing to do to ask Tom to read some target books so he read the giant robot pyramids of Mars the brain of Morbius and the creature from the pit and it was while he was recording the fourth of those pyramids of mars that he said to us in studio uh wouldn't it be marvelous if we had some original doctor who stories and so we said yes it would tom that would be wonderful uh you know if you're interested in doing that and we had a lunch and um that was a very memorable time when we talked about what we could do and Tom had a few ideas. And so I went away and put together a sort of structure for Hornet's Nest. 
and then I got Paul Mars on board and um, he wrote the scripts for Hornet's Nest and the key tenets of of Hornet's Nest were that the doctor was living in a cottage in Sussex and he had a housekeeper and Tom as far as I recall Tom came up with the name Mrs Wibsey uh, I came up with the name Nest Cottage and uh, we were I, I the idea I had was that the brigadier would um, be reunited with the doctor that's those are the, the, the scripts that we we made and so from that point on Tom was fully on board uh, he hadn't reprised the role of the doctor since 1981 in any great form I think he'd done that children in need and um, this was his uh, his chance to to return to the role of the doctor which he he relished and um, you know we sort of flew by the seat of our pants with the first series and we were discovering what we could do and how we could do it. And um, it went very well. So then we, could, we, could, we repeated the exercise with two more series. There's something rather horrible about fighting monsters who aren't even alive. You can't hear them breathing because they don't breathe. And they can sneak up on you easy as anything because their footsteps are soft and muffled. Their insides rustle with stuffing and sawdust. And so you have to listen very, very carefully in the night to hear them approach. They mostly come out at night. That's when stuffed animals go hunting. Their victims rarely hear them until it's too late. There's a strange smell, perhaps formaldehyde, a whiff of mothballs, an aroma of spoiled leather or musty fur. Being dead doesn't deter these beasties from trotting and traipsing about in the night. And some of them are quite dangerous, you know. Oh, yes. That snow leopard in the study. <laughs> He'd have your head off as soon as look at you. The giant hare in the downstairs hall could give you a nasty thumping if he was so inclined. I first became aware of these nocturnal misdeeds a few short weeks ago. I was on a little break here in the peaceful countryside, and I happened upon a local paper's garbled report of the death of a cabinet minister. He'd been trampled to death in his own bed, the terrible imprint of a hoof upon his forehead, a hoof print belonging to an alpine ibex, Mike. Not a goat one normally associates with Sussex. Quite, and not something one would expect to be attacked by in the middle of the night in one's own bed. So what's the story with um, Big Finish doing full cast audio, BBC audio, and audio go at that stage? Um, was there any sense of... like? Was there a sense of competition between you at all or just totally different projects happening? Totally different projects happening. Big Finish has always been a licensee of BBC Worldwide and ostensibly in the 2000s, they were a licensee of BBC Audiobooks. So, you know, we had a, a close and very sort of friendly business relationship and they had started in late, was it 98 99 with their their range they were doing forecast drama and we were majoring on um single voice you know and when it came to hornet's nest originally it was not set up as a forecast drama it was really set up as a multi-voice narrative and my my original idea was that the doctor and the brigadier would recount adventures to each other and as they were recounting they would you know do the voices as it were it would be a sort of a, a, an amalgam of a, an audio book and a, a multi-voice reading i think we quickly realized that that had limitations so a few more characters were brought in However, we still didn't look upon that first series as a true full cast drama. But then it just developed um, across the three series. So by the end, it pretty much was full cast audio drama. But we didn't suddenly, we didn't then think, all oh, right, so this is what we do now. We do all. It was an exception, um, that, that, that Tom Baker series. And then we 
really once we stopped doing that we returned to doing the the target audio books the audio original stories that we commission the bbc books novels and so on and i think similarly over at big finish they have as the years have gone by they've moved into you know they, they had the short trips range which were single voice readings and um latterly they've started doing full length audio novels so i think there's always been the realization that we can all do we can all play with the format we can all try and, and do different things and there's there is room for it because that's what Doctor Who is so good at is is accommodating such a lot of stories to be told. So it's certainly I don't think it, it's ever really been a case of us being in competition. It's just we do we 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 do broadly we do different types of audio, but sometimes there's crossover. Sometimes we we swap a little bit, you know. So. You've been the commissioning editor all the way from Audio Go to now, or did that did something change so that you became the commissioning editor at BBC Audio afterwards since 2013? Or how's your role progressed since those days? When I joined uh, Radio Collection, they quickly realised that I had an interest in and knew, knew a lot about the Doctor Who range, and um, none of my colleagues did. And so they were really glad to hand the reins over of the range to me. So I started really being the commissioning editor of the Doctor Who range, probably in 2002. Uh, and the first thing I did was set up Doctor Who at the BBC, which um, was the arc, the, you know, the, the range of releases which went into the radio and TV archive and brought out all of these um, interviews uh, behind the scenes features that hadn't been heard for years going all the way back to the 60s and it together it, it tells we've we've actually just released it as Doctor Who at the BBC the collection nine volumes and it tells an amazing behind the scenes story of Doctor Who so yes I started really looking after the Doctor Who range way back in 2002 2003 then when we moved to Bath, when we became BBC Audiobooks, I became a commission. I, uh, I think for a little time I was looking after the copywriting team and then I became a commissioning editor, um, looking after all, not just Doctor Who, but a whole range of stuff. Since 2013, um, I, have, I, I did a stint working on the general range, but now I look after... Doctor Who solely, and I also um, work on the Demon Records Doctor Who releases. So that's the vinyl box set releases that we're now putting out. Are you familiar with those? Yes, yeah. yes, I am. Yeah, beautiful. Love, uh, love. Uh, they're great for the artwork. Those those covers, aren't they? They are. So yeah, they're very, amazing. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Yes, yeah, some very sort of high high spec on the production so and, and demon also put out uh other bbc titles as well so we, we've done things like faulty towers blackadder um the neil gaiman um radio dramatizations and uh, stuff like that so what else does your job involve as commissioning editor what are, what are your other responsibilities what what does a week look like for you to say we were a small team back uh, in the early 2000s is true, but we're an even smaller team now. And really, uh, I, I I initiate titles. I think I, I decide what we're going to publish and then see them all the way through to publication. So, um, and I, I work with a band of um, freelancers, um, producers, sound engineers or uh, sound designers and um, graphic designers and so my my job is to ensure that we keep publishing Doctor Who titles and to populate the schedule every year and then to prepare the scripts cast the readers assign sound designers um, 
enable the producers to be able to record. So uh, I, I provide um, an, an information sheet for every title, which gives it's a sort of crib sheet on um, characters, characterizations, how voices should sound. And um, I do the same for the sound designer because uh, certain voices we try to match to their TV counterparts. We, we only do that with a handful of characters, you know, the Daleks, the Cybermen and K-9. Other than that, we sort of, we give ourselves free reign. We think, well, we, we're not slavishly trying to replicate um, the sound of the TV episodes. So, um, well, I think that's a good then, thing. That, that yeah. Not, it's good to enjoy these stories on a, you know, as a completely unique experience, I think. I think that works well. I think so as well. And I think particularly with the target range, it does exist in its own little sub-universe, I think, doesn't it? Because, mm. you know, there have been so many of them deviate from what was seen on screen. And um, so it's nice. And, and right at the start with the target range, we, uh, Simon Power, the the person who has sound designed most of, there's just one title that he hasn't sound designed in, in terms of the target range. He devised um, a sound for the interior control room and it was not like, I think I must have said, you know, we don't want to use the TV interior. Well, let's come up with our own. So he came up with this one and, you know, that has been the sound of the inside of the TARDIS through all of the Target books. And I think people now really like it. And they, you know, the, the, it, so the series has its own sort of continuity. Are you allowed to have access to the sound effects of the BBC? You don't tend, don't tend to use the music at all. Is that for copyright reasons as well? No. Um, again, we just decided um, we, on the target range, we wouldn't use the, the theme music because, again, it sort of fosters an expectation that you're going to listen to a TV episode in a way. So... Um, we don't do that on our audio originals. We do use the the Doctor Who theme tune on those, and indeed, usually if we do a BBC book. And in fact, with the modern Target novelisations, we have been using the the TV theme tune at, at the start and end. But with the the classic uh, range, as you might call it, we just never did. But yeah, we do have access to the BBC sound effects so we had a story an audio original which features the uh, the time lord stasers and so we used we used the effect from the invasion of time and the deadly assassin on on those you know who decides what actor is going to do the recordings i decide that you know we built up a sort of repertoire of of readers over the years and um some who joined us right at the start are still reading for us now such as jeffrey bieber's others have moved away from recording maybe you know have retired some some of our readers are retired and others are new to the range and uh, it's always a case of trying to match the voice i think i always think the the most important thing is to match the voice to the tone of the book and sometimes a story is is dominated or heavily influenced by a particular character and, you know it's that character's voice that shapes the narrative or drives the narrative and so you really want to get that voice correct so you look for somebody who you know can naturally do that voice also as, you, as you'll be aware we've also always striven to have some people who have readers who are associated either with Doctor Who generally or perhaps with a specific story. So, you know, first thing I'd do is, is really look at that. Is there anybody from the original TV story who could perhaps read it? And if there isn't, then who else might be a good person to, to put to that story? Yeah, I like Claire Corbett, for instance, who recently did the Fires of Pompeii, absolutely spot on she was fantastic in that dan stark yeah. is fantastic as an all-rounder so he's good but i do look at titles like 
uh, I think Enlightenment is it with Stephen Stephen Pacey. What's, yeah. What made you go for Stephen Pacey? Because he has no connection with Doctor Who, and he hasn't done many other books either. So, what was what was your dis- decision behind uh, casting him? Well, Stephen, I knew was a very accomplished audiobook reader, and um, if you look on Audible, uh, you'll see his name assigned to countless audiobooks. And at the time, uh, he's he's read term he read Terminus and he read Enlightenment, and I think Terminus was the original recording that Stephen made for us. Again, thinking about the characters, you had uh, Olvir, the the space pirate. You had Turlo, and you had uh, all of the veneer. So a lot of male voices. And um, there's something about the tone of the story and the, t- the tone of Stephen's voice that I just thought might work well. And um, so that was the first one that he did and um I, I thought it was a terrific reading when it came to it just by chance happened to be that the subsequent story enlightenment um i thought actually that, that might work very very nicely for stephen as well and of course sometimes you are working with your your schedule and actors availability and also you're looking at well which other readers have are coming out this year um, and trying to get a mix of, of voices and of names and so on. So Stephen is, you know, a very talented re- recruit to the range, really. And he, he also read um, one of our audio originals, The Kairos Ring. So he's an example, I think, of uh, a, a, a very few um people who haven't been in Doctor Who. Of course, I always think of Blake Seven really as Doctor Who's sister show. Uh, so there's, there's that. But John Coggshaw is another example of somebody who's, had, well, certainly at that time, had never been in Doctor Who. But I had a hunch that John might make a very good audiobook reader. So we got in touch with him and we, we um, myself and my... Um, at, at the time, my boss, we met with John. This was, you know, going back quite quite a few years now. And uh, we had a chat with him and he said he would be interested. So the first title that he did was The Ark in Space. And that turned out really well. And of course, you know, if you're bringing somebody new to the range, you, you're you listening, you're waiting with bated breath for the recording to come in and see how it's gone. But... Uh, the, you know john's obviously went terrifically well he was obviously a, a, he was a an obvious person to do fourth doctor at the time i thought because he was famous for his tom baker impression and uh, sure enough he, you know when he because did, if, uh, i mean the, the five doctors is yeah a, i was gonna say <laughs> yeah five doctors y- yeah. yeah well what I, what I quickly realized was that john is a huge fan of the third doctor I think, you know, in many ways, possibly the third doctor is his doctor in terms of when he was growing up. So he let me know that he was very keen to read some third doctor stories, which he has now done. And uh, and the five doctors, yes, uh, he was the man really to do that. And I think he loved doing it. The, another voice that he loves doing is the Brigadier. Brigadier. Mm. You know, I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to this reunion. The chance to meet old friends again. Brigadier Crichton put down his glass. There's one chap we've been trying to get hold of for ages. Mysterious sort of fellow. Used to be your unpaid scientific advisor. The Brigadier smiled. Ah, the Doctor. That's right, the Doctor. The Brigadier smiled reminiscently. Wonderful chap. All of them. Crichton looked curiously at him. Them? More than one, was there? Well, yes and no, said the brigadier. To his relief, they were interrupted by the buzz of the desk intercom. Crichton flicked the switch. Yes? The voice of the duty sergeant crackled out. Excuse me, sir, sorry to interrupt. Someone's arrived. I'm not expecting anyone. Who is it? 
There was a tinge of desperation in the sergeant's voice. I'm not sure, sir. He insists on seeing Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart. The tone of the sergeant's voice changed as he addressed the unseen intruder. I'm sorry, sir. You're not allowed in there. What? said a familiar voice indignantly. Me? Not allowed? I'm allowed everywhere. Just get out of the way, will you? Thank you. The office door was flung open, and a little figure popped inside, eluding the grasp of the unit sergeant. The newcomer looked swiftly round the room. Brigadier! <laughs> he rushed across to them and shook hands warmly. Good heavens! said the brigadier faintly. Is it really you? For once, I've been able to steer the TARDIS correctly, and here I am. Brigadier Crichton caught the duty sergeant's eye. It's all right, sergeant. Yes, sir, said the sergeant, woodenly, and withdrew. Crichton studied the newcomer curiously. He saw an odd-looking little fellow, in a shabby old frock coat and rather baggy check trousers. Untidy black hair hung in a fringe over his forehead, and his dark brown eyes seemed humorous and sad at the same time. The little man looked hopefully up at the brigadier. I'm not too late, am I? What for? Your speech as guest of honour. Brigadier Crichton looked at him in astonishment. How did you know the brigadier would be here? Saw it in the Times. Impossible, the reporter's still here. Tomorrow's Times, said the little man witheringly. He turned to the brigadier. Who is this fellow? Colonel Crichton, my replacement. The little man sniffed. Mine was pretty unpromising, too. Can I ask a question about covers? Because yes. I mean, one, of the, one of the distinctive things about all the ranges is you know, magnificent covers, and Target had amazing covers, which are still loved by many. You have yeah. gone for traditional covers for most of your audiobooks, but then you pull out ones that aren't. So um, Visitation, Mordred and Dead, Terminus. What, why the decision about when you decide to use a target cover and when you don't? Is that a copyright thing or something else? The main intention was and still is really to use the original book cover if possible. And for, I would say, 80% of the time we do that. In the early days, there were a few variations where, for example, when we did the Doctor and the Giant Robot, we had the original cover. I uh, forget the name of the artist. Terrific, terrific, renowned Peter artist. Peter Brooks. Peter Brooks, Peter Brooks. And then we had the reprint cover, which is that lovely dark blue with this, the very striking image of the, the robot's head. And that's actually, that, that was the copy that I had in my collection. So I'd grown up with that. And so I just made the decision. And, I, you know, you have to be a little bit. The, the range was in its early days. It was ostensibly a new audiobook range. You have to have a little bit of a commercial eye on things and think, well, you know, our sales team are going out to, to retailers and they're presenting this range, which is going to look the most impressive. And I decided for Doctor and the Giant Robot that that reprint cover would actually be the most impressive and we did the same, I think, with Planet of the Spiders as well. We also did it with the Sea Devils. And in all of those cases, we went with the, the second edition artwork. But for the most part, we go with the original. The three that you mentioned, Terminus, Morgan Undead and The Visitation, they had all had photographic covers originally. And I didn't want to do photographic covers but I do remember commissioning Nick Spender for the the visitation cover and being very pleased with it and Nick also was commissioned to do the cover of An Unearthly Child which he did and that is that is a beautiful cover and that's another reason why it's such a shame that we, we didn't get to release that one it may have been you know that I just didn't um I just wanted to do something different than than the second edition artwork can't remember. Alistair, of course, has been a wonderful contributor to the range. And in recent years, he has taken it upon himself to rework some of his uh, originals. 
and so I think you know, yeah, the, the, possibly, power, the, the power of the Daleks looks amazing. That reworking he's done, yeah, yeah, as, as an example, uh, yes, absolutely. And he's 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 working on some others. We just possibly today or tomorrow, certainly this week, sometime the cover of Silver Nemesis should be going up, which again he's he's reworked. So it may have been the back in the back when we did Mordrian Undead and Terminus, you know, going back a few years now. Uh, if we were doing those today, Alistair might say, oh, I, actually, I think I could rework some of these. Um, but that, that, that wasn't the case. How the difficult is it to get a book shape cover onto a square CD? Can be very difficult. It can be very difficult. Some covers lend themselves a lot more easily than others. Because, for instance, you know, we've got a terrific um, graphic designer, Kevin Minty of Minty Design, who who's done most of our covers. Sometimes, it, you know, if if an image, all of the target books were really in portrait style, if an image happened to be bounded by uh, space, you know, outer space, stars and so on, then that's very easy to extend left and right to make a square. Uh, if, though, somebody's shoulder ends you know uh somebody's arm ends at the shoulder then it's a rather bigger uh, challenge to extend the arm fully and, you know we do if we can the other thing that we're having to work with is the current doctor who logo and some give more room than others so yeah it can be can be a bit of a challenge of course it's it's rather nice now to have the the new logo and the version of the new logo that we're using is what's known as the horizontal version so it's the the doctor who words but it's without the background diamond because of course that diamond just cuts right down into your your artwork but it's rather nice that that is also the version that was used on the target books in the 70s so in a way it's coming home but I was really keen that all of our 2023 titles should carry the new logo. So we had that little moment in late 2022 when we were waiting for the assets uh, so that we could get, get going on the artwork. But we've, we've managed it. So the Romans was the first title that, that had the new logo. Now, speaking of the Romans, we were talking about John Colshaw a little while ago, and he appears in the Romans with six other readers in that book. Yeah. It's not one of the yeah. longest books ever, but we've got six different readers. Tell us about the process uh, in deciding to to present the audio book this way. It's a fantastically done, by the way. It's my favourite audio book. It was obvious, really, because of the way the book was written in that epistolary style. Uh, it's a, it's a mix of letters and diary entries. It was an obvious candidate for doing a multi voice reading. A talented single voice reader could, of course, have ploughed all the way through and, and done all of the voices. But it seemed like a good opportunity to do something a little bit different. And Jamie Glover has recently read three First Doctor stories that feature Ian Chesterton. So in a way, he's taken over the mantle of Ian Chesterton for the target range. So I thought, well, from, of course, the superbly talented William Russell. So Jamie seemed like an obvious person to read Ian's diary, uh, no, Ian's letters to the headmaster. And then I just had to think about, you know, other other people who we, we work with and the characters that they, they might suit. And Tim Trelaw has done this lovely characterization, characterization of uh, Ascaris. It's hilarious. Yeah, he's so funny. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> uh, he's got a touch of the the Welsh valleys to his voice. Just and, a touch. Uh, yeah, just a touch. But Dan um, Stark, then, he's, like Dan Stark is a wonderful first doctor. Yes. We we have a couple of candidates for first doctor voices now. And um, Dan has read first doctor stories for our Doctor Who annuals range and uh, John Culshaw has done the same and he does a superb first doctor but um, 
I thought that John might be very nice as Nero and that Dan, as you say, he's very, very accomplished at, at the first Doctor. So that was the way that worked out. Then uh, we were working with Maureen O'Brien because I had I had asked Maureen to read uh, a few other bits for different releases. And I also thought it would be really nice for her to read uh, something from the Romans as she was in the original Romans. So she makes what you might call a cameo appearance, doesn't she? It's just one one of the many entries in, in the, the book is read by her. But she she really nails that the poisoner down so well, like <laughs> yeah, uh, just this, oh, back and forth, and yeah, wonderfully done. Yeah, and it's nice that she's encountering Vicky, who, who yes. was her her character. Then, of course, Barbara's uh, Lou Jemison. Yes, which I thought would be a nice a nice fit, you know. And um, who else have we got there? Is that everybody? I think it might no, be Claire got, Corbett. Uh, yeah, Claire. Oh, Claire! Yes, Claire. Claire. Now you see Claire. First, I first knew of Claire because she did a, uh, a she had a role in Hornet's Nest with Tom Baker, and Claire is you know amazingly talented uh, voice artist. And since then, she's read a couple of books for the 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 target range. She read a big. BBC Books novel, The Droston's Curse. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one. It's actually a fourth Doctor story. And that came out well, probably about 10 years ago now. So Claire reads that. And she's done other other titles for us over the years. So, uh, yeah, I just thought about, thought about Claire. We had her on the programme and just she just talked through her method of preparation. And it was just amazing how thorough, thorough and well-prepared she is. Yeah, I, it was very interesting to listen to that from her perspective, uh, because uh, you know she did she did she was at pains to mention the engineers as uh, she, as she called them, uh, and of course she's an example of a reader who now does record from home, so does have to be more in control of the technical aspects um, than um, uh, than a reader that just turns up into studio but um yeah it was interesting i mean the 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 preparation that a reader has to do the the homework that they have to put into it is is sizable um but we are there in the background offering tips and guidance and um saying you know how voices ought to sound but at the end of the day of course the reader has to be comfortable with with what they're doing so you can't impose too much upon them and some readers do a high level of voice characterization and others don't and both is fine really now you you were holding it up before another range that's uh, come out recently is beyond the doctor how did that range uh was that your idea yes um it it was and it was really just came out of uh thinking what else might we do because we have a range of audio original titles that we've been publishing since i think 2007 they tend to be an hour and 10 minutes single stories and they can feature any of past doctors with or without companions and that continues to this day but uh i just thought mm, well is there uh, is there another way of looking at original stories is there another aspect and i've always been interested in the idea of what happens to companions after they leave the doctor so i sort of thought well let's let's try and uh, have a few stories just featuring companions so they don't actually feature the doctor the one of the first ones that i commissioned was the kairos ring from stephen gallagher 
and that features Romana um, after Warrior's Gate. I also, I also asked um, uh, another long-term collaborator, Paul Mars, to come up with some ideas. And so Paul came up with the idea of Bessie Come Home. I think it was Bessie Come Home that he came up with first, which is Bessie, which was left to feel. I wasn't quite thinking of Bessie when I was thinking of past companions of the Doctor. But, uh, you know, we talked about it, we kicked around some ideas and uh, I suddenly thought, hey, yeah, this is a brilliant idea, we must do this. We've all, we also did Sleeper Agents, which was a, a Polly and Ben story read by Annika Wills. And during the course of writing those two, I think this is how it worked, Paul came up with some sort of guest characters and a story arc started to evolve featuring those characters. So then we added uh, London 1965, which features Ian and Barbara. And then we've, we, 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 we realised we had a sort of little story arc going on, which is sort of, we loosely call it the Penumbra saga. And... Um, it has now concluded with the final story called The Penumbra Affair, and that features Mrs. Wibsey. So again, it's a little bit left of field because obviously Mrs. Wibsey isn't a TV companion, but she's become very dear to a lot of our listeners through the Nest Cottage series. And um, we have previously had single voice audio original stories featuring Mrs. Wibsey and the Doctor read by Susan Jameson. So that's what has happened so far with Beyond the Doctor. It wasn't intended really to be a story arc. And the first release, The Kairos Ring, is separate, stands alone. But it just so happens that the other four that we've done so far have all now formed part of this penumbra um, story arc. We don't have any immediate plans to, to do more, but I, I, I'd like to do more a bit further in the future. Because, you know, so obviously some characters, there isn't a lot to say about after, particularly Adric, for instance. Uh, and others, of course, have had a strong afterlife in the Big Finish range. And so it might be difficult to come up with alternative, an alternative history for them, or it might be counterproductive to do that. So, um, you know, it's just... A, if the if the opportunity arises, I think we'll do more. No, that's excellent. I particularly enjoyed Bessie Come Home and London 1965. Those two really stand out as some as something really different and unique uh, yeah. in the in the Doctor Who audio ranges. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you enjoyed those. Uh, I agree, and you know that's Paul's talent. Yeah, he's he's very very talented writer, and I really enjoy working with Paul and. Um, We've we've collaborated a lot over the years. He's very original. He's very witty. Um, he's he's very off the wall, and I I often sort of have, have to rein that in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, he's 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 great. Very talented. And almost at once, all my glorious modifications were put to the test. We were instructed by the brigadier to present ourselves forthwith at a series of secret locations. At each of them, there had been strange and impossible goings-on. Forthwith, the doctor had cried, appalled. I was delighted to bear my new owner and his young friend, Liz Shaw, to all these distant places. I was desperate to race all the way there on my beautiful new wheels, to rev my impossible engines, and to get them there just as forthwith as ever they liked. Oh dear, is that a growing scepticism on the face of my devoted Mr Foreman? As the afternoon wanes and the shadows lengthen in our corner of the junkyard, I tell him the top secret tale of the lizard people, hidden away sleeping under Wenley Moor, such a long time ago now, fifty years. But that's a drop in the ocean compared with how long those reptile people had slept. Oh, yes. 
clever reptiles who dated back from the time of the dinosaurs. They'd been slumbering in bunkers far underground, like scaly Rip Van Winkles hoping to evade disaster when a certain meteor had collided with their world. Thanks to a mechanical failure, they slept for much longer than they had meant to. Well, I know how that can go. They then woke many millions of years in the future, only to discover that the apes, as they called them, now ruled supreme on their planet Earth. I was at hand with the Doctor and Professor Shaw and the Brigadier when the lizard men came creeping out of their subterranean base. They were wreaking havoc and planning revenge. I was called upon to hurtle across the moors with jeeps and all kinds of military escorts. I did feel proud I was in the thick of the action, taking the doctor to the very heart of the adventure, where he went head to head with his opponents and tried to reason with them. He tried to make peace. This was to be my role for the next few years. I would transport the doctor to where he needed to be in order to save the whole planet. And I took my duties very seriously, of course. So can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with the Big Finish Short Trips? You produced a few. What was your involvement there? I did. Yeah, well, that was just after uh, Audio Go came to an end in 2013. And, um, you know, my uh, Big Finish very kindly asked me if I would like to produce um, some of the short trips, which I did. Um, I'm not a technical producer so I don't sit in studio and you know run the control board so producing in that instance was uh, a case of commissioning scripts and and then casting and pairing and work working with uh, again the sound designers and so on and and the producer who was going to be in studio and I did go I did attend uh, many if not all of the actual studio recordings for those at the time and uh i think yeah i got fond memories of a lot of those stories did first second third fourth doctor fifth doctor yeah i think we actually we covered all of the doctors did we do a seventh doctor i can't remember now but yes that was fun to do for a time and then but quite quickly in 2014 the Doctor Who, the the, B, the Doctor Who range did re-emerge. The BBC Audio Doctor Who range did re-emerge. Um, done straight out of London, except that it, it was actually being done by by me in Bath. Uh, again, working on this this basis that you know we record we record uh, most of our titles or many of our titles at Ladbrook Audio in so in London with Neil Gardner, who's really the producer who has has sat and, and worked with the, the readers for, I would say, the majority of our titles in the last 10 years. So, yeah, that's how we began again. And because I, I became that, that picked up again and I, I started working on that, then I, I didn't continue with any, any more big finish work. But it was gotcha. very nice to... To, to work uh, work with them. I think Lisa Bowman produced several of those short trips. And, uh, yeah, happy memories of going down and, and working with Lisa, who's great. Big Finish presents Doctor Who Short Trips Washington Burns Outside the house, Major General Robert Ross dragged himself from under the body of his fallen horse. He knelt down beside the body of his old friend then looked at the flag of truce in his hand. Ross turned back to the rest of the men in his party. He could see that Coburn was smirking, the Admiral clearly knowing what Ross was about to order. No more truce. Next to him, the gentleman from the chateau seemed to be thinking hard, but then he always seemed to be thinking hard. Ross turned to the small group of sailors that Coburn had brought up with them, and calmly ordered them to burn the townhouse to the ground. Rear Admiral George Coburn turned to the gentleman from the chateau. It seems you were right, Doctor. 
There'll be fires burning tonight. Silently, the doctor nodded. Big finish. We love stories. We've just had announced, over the last couple of days, I think, at the time of recording, some new Target novelizations coming out in the middle of the year. Yeah. So we got audio books to go with those? Oh, those ones. Yes, I see what you mean. Yes, absolutely. Uh, fingers crossed. Yes. Um, I just had a quick look and there haven't been any readers announced yet. So that's no coming soon. Um, I'm literally work, working on it at the moment. The challenge with new books is always, and uh, I think Claire alluded to this, is always that we aim to simpub the audio publication with the book. But of course, the script hasn't been lying around on a shelf for years like the Target books. The script is new and is still being written and copy edited and proof proofread and so on. So there is that, uh, that period of time where you hope you will have the script in time to record and edit and add the sound design and so on and get off to the manufacturers in time for publication date. What is the turnaround that you need to be able to record edit, add sound design? Well, I tend to allow um, I tend to allow a month for sound design, which just means that the sound designer who you know may be working on several projects at, this, at any one time has, has a comfortable amount of time to do his or her work. That can be contracted if, if we need a really quick turnaround. Tend to allow a month for that. Recording only needs one or two days, but it has to fit in with the reader's availability and, and studio availability as well. And then that requires, um, I mean, Neil does turn around edits pretty quickly. So he, he can have what we call a vocal edit ready in a week, really. That goes off to the sound designer then. Once, that, once the sound design has come in, then I listen and give feedback to the sound designer. Once I've done that, and it, it then goes off somewhere else and is proof listened to. So uh, there we have a band of proof listeners and they are reading it alongside the script. And that's where they will pick up on... You have proof listeners, like you have proof readers. I've never imagined yeah. that. Do all your books get yeah. proof listen listen to they do they do they do how do you get that job i'd love that i'm job. free i'm free for that <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it sounds like a, a good job and i think the, the the people who do it uh enjoy it but it's demanding because, oh no it'd be great yeah if it's an eight hour book that's not really eight hours you know if i when i'm listening i listen you know when i'm in the car when i'm walking when I'm doing the washing up, you know, and I'm taking it all around with me uh, all the time. But what I'm not hearing is a tummy rumble or a, um, a, a little hiccup in the editing or a, f a fluff of a line. And that's where the proof listeners have to do a really close listen. So for that eight hours, that's eight hours you've got to spend sitting at a desk with the script and with the, the sound on a really good um, set of headphones. And you have to have really good hearing. And that's where the, their work is invaluable. So, yeah, I mean, you may well enjoy it, but it, it's, uh, it's, hard, it's, it's, it's quite hard. You can't skimp on that. Yeah, yeah so they, they do that. But if you've got any you know, positions open, I would love some. <laughs> Okay. That'd be a great job. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll bear, I'll bear you in mind. I, yeah. I feel. I feel like I do it anyway half the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know. I mean, the the amount of audio that you guys must ha have to listen to. Uh, it's large. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. Very very hard to keep up. Now, in terms yeah. of these new books coming out, because now we know that the audio is coming out at the same time as the novel, will the 
people designing the front book cover think of you at all or not? They will not, consult with no. you? No. Okay. No. You no, think you could actually no. work together, wouldn't you, in terms of one product that actually works? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah no. it's, it's, inter- it's, it's interesting. You know, BBC Books are over there doing their thing. But and, with a couple yeah. of them, the audio's already been done, hasn't it? Warrior's Gate's being produced as a book, but that's I think that's got extra bits in it that aren't on the audio, but the audio's already been done. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So Warrior's Gate is an example of uh, we, we commission the ex banded version of Stephen Gallagher's story, which was actually, as as I'm sure you know, his original manuscript that he submitted to Target Books and was rejected uh, by John Nathan Turner, who at that time, you know, was was looking over what Target Books were doing very closely. Uh, I forget now what what the basis on which John well I think I think it was too. It was too long, and he didn't feel that it represented the story closely enough. It wasn't that yeah. he expanded and changed a lot of things. Yeah. Well, because yeah, what he wanted because the TV show got rid of all the stuff he liked, and so he he restored that back to the book, and then John Nathan Turner got yes. rid of it again. Sure, absolutely. So uh, a few years ago, I approached Stephen and, and said, "Well, you know, could we do the?" It it become a, a bit of a myth um, in fan circles, I suppose, the original script of Warrior's Gate. And I knew a few people who had been involved in talking to Stephen over the years and saying, well, you know, could could this be done as a book now, as an expanded book? And none of the attempts had ever really come off. But when I got in touch with Stephen, um, I, it was quite straightforward. He said, yeah, I've got it ready, actually. So um, we did the audio version of that. Uh, John Colshaw read it. Now BBC Books um, uh, approached me and said, you know, could would we be happy for them to to do the the print version? Which of course, um, you know, I was very happy for them too. So they're doing that. They're adding in the script of the Kairos Ring, which I mentioned earlier, which is the Beyond the Doctor story that Stephen wrote. And I believe they're also adding in another shorter story, which. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't know anything about that that one. So that's going to be uh, that volume. We, therefore, we won't do a new audio reading. We will just stick with our version that we've got already. And that's what we did with Stones of Blood and the Androids of Tara, which were also print versions of the scripts that I'd commissioned from David Fisher. That came about at a period where I... We were well into recording the, the target books. And uh, it was an idea that I'd had oh, for many, many years. The idea being, what if a target book had been written by somebody else? And I used to I used to think, yeah, we know the target books that we have. But what if you mixed up all the author names and you had, um, you know, Doctor Who and the Daleks written by Malcolm Hulk or uh, um, whatever permutations. I was also aware at the time that some of the Terence Dick's late 70s novelizations were slim. And much as I loved the original, uh, the Terence Dick's novelization of The Stones of Blood, which I remember you know, lapping that up when I... Me too, several times. Yes, yes, yeah. It's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a quick read, really. Stones of Blood is one of my favourite TV stories. And I had heard that David Fisher... I don't know how true it is, but, you know, it's often said that David Fisher had been disappointed that he hadn't been given the opportunity to novelise The Stones of Blood and The Androids of Tara first time round. Of course, a few years later, he did novelise The Creature from the Pit. Um, So I put all of these thoughts together and thought, actually, what would a novelisation of The Stones of Blood be like if it was written by David Fisher? And how much more of the story would he be able to tell us? You know, there are so many tantalising references in the original TV episodes about 
Professor Rumford, Miss Fay, the the cottage where they live, their background, and also uh, De Vries, you know, and that fa- their famous line uh, where um, they he and his wife are escaping the ogre, and she said, "Oh, we could be in Plymouth in an hour or something." So you think immediately, think, right? So they're in Cornwall, and. Um, uh, but in, t- on the t- in the TV series, it's never actually explicitly stated where they where 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 it is set. So uh, all of these sorts, and, and I thought, well, it, nothing to stop us asking David Fisher if he would like to novelise it, it now. So I got in touch with him, and um, he was very keen on the idea of doing that. So. We, uh, we we talked, we had some phone conversations and um, he produced his first draft of, of The Stones of Blood, which was wonderful. Um, you know, a really, really superb retelling of the story. And, um, you know, we I, I edited that and worked on it with him a little bit. There are, there are a few things that um, he had... Um, he had uh, invented, which were more to do with the the key to time and the origins of of that the mission, the Doctor and Romana's mission to to find the second of the key to time, which uh, w- were a little bit wide of the mark. So you know, we worked on that. But anyway, we we did that one, and that had worked very well. And um, so then I asked him if he would like to do the androids of Tara as well, which he did. And uh, again, he, he was able to add a, an awful lot of background history to the planet and the society. Do so you think you're going to release the Terrence Experience at some point to then as well? I think uh, one day I would very much like to do that. Uh, but um, it's probably a question of how and when we would do that. I mean, obviously, it would give us all the major headache, wouldn't it, if we had two versions of the I've got story. two books on my bookshelf now. I can manage having two audio books as well. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I would like to think that that would be possible at, at, at some stage. You must be coming now close to the end in terms of, you know, the, all these stories about the target, you know, as Target was running out of stories, what they were going to start doing. You must be now starting to come to the end of recording range what's what's your long-term plan obviously yes the plan is to do as many of the target books and and you know a few additional bolt-on titles that, that loosely come under that heading uh to, to complete that range um beyond that uh, i have a few ideas in in planning, but nothing concrete to announce at the moment. We will obviously continue with our audio originals range and also with any new titles that BBC Books come up with that are suitable. Um, there are a few options for, for for things that might fill the take the take the place of the target range. Um, but uh, at the moment I can't say for certain what they will be. Of course, our other uh, Doctor Who titles have been the TV soundtracks, the narrated TV soundtracks, which is where we began, really. And and, uh, that was the heart of the business for so many years. But we've we've published those. Um, We we recently republished them as the classic, as the missing episodes collection. Um, We published them digitally for the first time. And some some people ask us, well, would we do narrated audio versions of Doctor Who TV soundtracks that did exist? Uh, we, we did do a few back in the day. Would we go on and do more? It would be lovely to create a complete range of audio Doctor Who TV adventures. And I think a lot of people would enjoy those, but um, they're quite labor intensive to create and therefore uh, you know there's a there's a cost associated with creating them and um 
we just have to be sh would have to be sure that there'd be enough people there there'd be a market there for them you know but who's to say and of course those are now getting a, a second life or third life fourth life whatever as lp releases as well your outbook this year is huge in terms of you're doing a doctor a month for the first seven months it's been released so your romans this month seeds of death time monster plan of evil war is the deep nightmare fair civil nemesis um I, is, is there more information about what's happening to finish off the year as we hit the 60th anniversary well we, we we're actually doing each of the 13 doctors, doctors in order one a month until we get to december where of course we've got to squeeze 13 doctors into 12 months so we will have uh, the 12th and 13th Doctor in December. But obviously they won't be, well, they won't be target books. So um, uh, I've been commissioning some audio original stories for the 8th Doctor and beyond. Obviously this, this year is a big year for all of us. It's an exciting year. It's doubly exciting. It's not only is it the diamond anniversary, but of course we have the new TV episodes to come in the autumn. I think there's going to be a lot going on, but I wanted to be sure that we were doing our bit to celebrate. And um, I thought, you know, it's, it's an, an obvious thing to do, perhaps to do a doctor a month. But uh, because of the the target books that we had left, it was something that we were able to do, and it's working out quite nicely. And then we have a couple of special releases. We have the Amazing World of Doctor Who, which is out in uh, I think it's March, and then it might be April. And we have the Making of Doctor Who, which is out in the summer, and those are both uh, famous books, as you know, from the 70s. Oh, it's actually the, it's actually the Terence Dix novel books you're turning into audio. Yeah, The Making of wow. Doctor Who is uh, it's an amalgamation of the two editions of the original book by Terence Dix and Malcolm Hulk. So there's one published in 1972 and one published in 1976. And uh, they are a mix of behind the scenes features synopsis and yeah th those were my yeah. bibles. as a kid those were my bibles i know and we've subtitled it the the 1970s program guide because of course it's not the making of doctor who now it's very much a time capsule of doctor who as it was in the 70s uh, terence Dix and markham Holt, they encapsulated the origins of doctor who they describe how doctor who started the people who were behind it how the daleks emerged and then they talk about the the cast of uh, people who the actors who played the doctors and the companions and so on there's then a huge uh, chapter on inside a television studio which is illuminating now you know for people who are perhaps less familiar with how television used to be made in the 70s and it's very nostalgic and then there are two chapters which look at the making of specific stories in the 1972 edition it was the sea devils and there's a report on going on location filming and then in the 1976 edition it's a report on how robot was brought to screen and again there's a really detailed studio report so they are it, it, all together it's a fascinating glimpse and reminder of doctor who as it was in the 1960s and 70s so that's the making of doctor who that seemed appropriate to do in this this year and the amazing world of doctor who is the special annual that came out in 1976 which is stories and comic strips and features and um We've, we've turned that into an audio presentation. I've well. got that as well. Have you? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good yeah. You'll, be, you'll be able to follow along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's got the iconic artwork by Chris Achilleos, you know, which oh, I just think is superb. It's beautiful. And luckily, 
it incorporated the the new logo which was the old logo you know the the, the diamond logo so um that was just a little bit of um what do you call it serendipity it's a, it's a dotto word really isn't it serendipity it is um, so yes all all those things are, are our way of celebrating the, the diamond anniversary sounds great well, thank you so much, Michael. We really appreciate you spending some time, a lot of time chatting with us about uh, these things uh, because we, we, we love our audio and it's great to get some insights on what goes on from your end. Well, you're very welcome. I mean, it's a, you know always a delight to talk about Doctor and talk about the range, but also I'm glad to be able to show, shed a little light on what we publish and how we, how we publish it. Interested in Professor Eldred and his antiquated machines? Come for a good laugh, I suppose, like the rest of them. The doctor looked shocked. People laugh at all this? But it's a magnificent exhibition. The old man looked suspiciously at him. We've had enough souvenir hunters, too. Now look here, we're not thieves, you know, began Jamie indignantly. We don't want to take anything, said the doctor. We are genuinely interested in space travel. He moved to the model rocket they had seen on the scanner, slim and elegant on its stand. Why, who wouldn't be interested in a thing like this? It's superb. Eldred moved to join him, looking sadly at the model. Yes, he said softly. Magnificent. It was to have been the vehicle to take men beyond the moon, but of course, <laughs> T-Mat put an end to all that. You mean the model's been abandoned? But its speed and stability concept alone, surely it's a tremendous advance in rocket design. Exactly, spluttered the old man, exactly. Here, let me show it to you. Tossing the blaster aside, he helped the doctor to lift the rocket and stand from its pedestal and rest it upon a low table. He pointed to the sudden thickening at the base of the rocket. This was the secret, the real breakthrough, a compact generator of enormous power. The doctor tapped the side of the rocket. This must be the secondary electrode accelerator. That's right, it beat the problem of the neutral cesium ions and, incidentally, magnified the G-thrust to fantastic proportions. That was awkward. What did you do about that? I'll show you, said Eldred eagerly. Come with me. He led the doctor over to a filing cabinet and produced and unrolled a sheaf of engineering blueprints. The doctor studied them absorbedly. My word, yes, I see. This is superb. Well, it was lovely having a chat with Michael. It was indeed. And um, yes, it's a fascinating range. I love my target books and great to hear what he's doing. Yeah, we need to we need to spend more time talking about them on the on the Sirens of Audio, give them a bit more even uh, coverage. Yes. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Particularly this a very important year, the 60th anniversary. It's um, lots and lots of good releases coming out. Speaking of good releases, we're going to recommend some, if they're Doctor Who related. They don't have to be, of course, when we do our recommendations. But the one thing we do have to do is let you go first, because I know it's your turn, Philip. Yeah, I'm just greedy like that. Um, I'm going to recommend two Target novels, um, because I can't can stick, stick to one. Uh, one of them is, I think, I'm, I'm not sure whether I've recommended this before, but Planet of the Spiders by Elizabeth Sladen. So it's the only uh, book she recorded herself. And it's beautifully read. It's a great story. They've re re released it with a new cover. I think we mentioned it along the way. But that's that was one of my first ones mm -hmm. that I listened to. And yeah, because I just love Elizabeth Sladen. That's really worthwhile. But I'm going to actually recommend to a one that's come out more recently, uh, which is The Face of Evil um, with Louise Jamison. Um, beautifully read, great story. And it's Terrence Sticks just writing really well. And. Yeah, that actually rope to death is really good. No, anyhow, I could, I could keep going. It's great range. Well worth getting into them. What about you, Dwayne? What are you going to recommend? I am going to recommend the release of this month, 
hopefully it's this month, this recording comes out, uh, when I expect it to, and that is The Seeds of Death. So that uh, is, there's only a few target books left to go in the range, as we said. So this was one of them. And I've recently reread this book, um, and it's typical Terence Dix. So with David Troughton uh, doing the reading too, I think it's very nice when um, someone so close to uh, the show actually gets to read it. Who someone so close to the show but wasn't involved in it? Yeah, if you know what I mean. But the fact that it's um, well, he did appear in episodes, but yes, not this one. And not he was in that season too, wasn't he? He was in that season. War was games. it a couple of times? No, it was just in the War Games, wasn't it? So, um, yes, yeah, Seeds of Death, uh, they don't go too far wrong as far as sound design goes these days. Uh, everything's sounding very, very polished and nice. And, uh, yeah, I can highly recommend that one. Indeed. Great stuff. That's it for today. As always, Philip, it's lovely to be in your presence. And it's wonderful to be in yours too, Dwayne, and with our listeners as well. Thanks for listening and watching, guys. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. And uh, or contact us via our socials. We'd love to hear from you. Have a good one. See ya. This has been the Sirens of Audio, episode 144, with our guest Michael Stevens, the commissioning editor for the BBC Audio Doctor Who range, and your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Our thanks to Kenny Smith. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Our website is sirensofaudio.com. You can email us at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or contact us by any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.